So um, this year, yeah, we are focusing on average current mode control. So hopefully it's not as crazy as usual with some weird topologies and uh, gallium nitride and high speed applications. This year, um, I would like to cover more uh, a topic that popped up in many other applications and is very dominant, especially in digital control. And this is average current mode control. Um, that's the reason why this is such a big deal in digital is uh, it solves a couple of problems, as we will see later on, and it is something that's kind of well suited for the digital control domain, while it's very hard to do in analog. And um, therefore, we thought it might be a good idea to just go over some of the basic concepts and uh, discuss some of the various uh, implementations of average current mode control for uh, specific applications. So from DC to DC to constant current sources and so forth. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is not the, so, next slide, okay. So the agenda, initially, I will just go over very briefly um, a review of the most common power supply control modes and their differences and their challenges um, to make the point for average current mode control. Then we will go over some of the implementations uh, that are common in average current mode control. And then uh, there's one particular implementation which is very special and quite fresh. So we kind of are hitting on that by ourselves right now. But the results we see are um, pretty interesting. And this is a different way how you're setting up and how you're designing your loop in the frequency domain. So it's a, a phase oriented um, approach where you couple multiple uh, feedback loops and the plant transfer function on the phase uh, to push it to a certain performance level. And that would be, uh, I think, the, the core piece of this presentation. And then afterwards, we'll have a short summary. OK, let's start with the basic control mode implementations. Uh, so as we all know, there's the possibility to just close a simple voltage mode uh, or voltage loop. So the, the feedback loop is looking at the output voltage. If it diverts from a reference, it adjusts either a duty cycle, a, a phase shift, or a, a, a period, and then um, brings up the voltage back into regulation. So this is the most simple feedback implementation. It's not the most simple compensator that we need for that, but it is definitely from the amount of circuit you need uh, and the connections you need, it's the simplest control loop implementation uh, of all. And then we have the current modes. So uh, the most prominent one is definitely peak current mode control, uh, where we um, modify the switch node. Um, so we are tying the inductor current back into its own feedback loop, but it's not really a feedback loop. It's more like we are um, using external triggers coming from comparators um, to tweak and manipulate the commutation of our switch node. So this is kind of an open loop built in additional switch node modulation capability, while the effective feedback loop is still a voltage loop. And um, then we have the derivatives of that approach, um, like constant on time, adaptive constant on time, or hysteretic modes like quasi resonant, boundary mode. Um, all of them um, use comparators where they uh, compare the most recent inductor current against thresholds, and then turn switches on or off accordingly. So when we look at voltage mode first, uh, the indirect it's an indirect control mode, because eventually what we are doing when we're turning on and off switches in the switch node is that we are controlling the charge of energy into the inductor or into the magnetic field of the inductor. While when we are uh, opening the switch or we release, uh, the inductor then the, distant, uh, the inductor discharges into the output filter, and this is what changes the output voltage. So the um, the value or the parameter we are observing is the output voltage because this is what's most interesting, especially in constant voltage sources like DC to DC converters. Um, but the thing we are controlling is uh, is not the one we are looking at. So this is why we call it an indirect control method. But it's very, very universal and uh, topology agnostic. So I can control any power supply circuit 
by just looking at the output voltage and adjusting the switch node commutation. It's a single uncritical feedback signal that makes it very cheap and easy to implement and it's applicable for pretty much everything like fixed frequency, variable frequency, phase shifted uh, uh, computation techniques. The limitations here is that the, sim the system linearization uh, does not work out that well. So we're leaving the circuit, the power supply circuit to its own. That means we allow resonances uh, to, to occur and the resonant bump um, results in a drop in impedance at the resonant frequency and that usually distorts your uh, desired linear control system. So we always have to work around that resonant frequency which is makes the compensation more, more tricky because you need more poles and zeros to compensate it and you always have this, uh, this limited frequency range around the, the resonant frequency which limits your capability to adjust crossover frequencies and, uh, and stability criteria like phase margin and gain margin. Um, and because we don't look at current, we also don't see when it's going out of bounds. So there is no built-in um, over current protection or short circuit protection. So all these are very good reasons to, uh, to move on to current mode later, but first we look at um, at the implementation on, on a feedback loop block diagram. So the way we are closing a, a voltage loop is we're sampling the voltage through, you combine during a, a, through a voltage divider, bringing the, the signal level down to something that our device can, can, can monitor. In, in case of a, of a digital controller, it would be the ADC reference voltage range. And then uh, the transient is downscaled by that voltage divider and fed into the ADC. The ADC converts the value and delivers the number to um, the digital version of an area amplifier. Um, here we just compare it uh, against the reference or we subtract it from the reference, um, turning this into an inverting error amplifier. Uh, at this point we're effectively extracting the error from the incoming transient and only the error, so we are extracting the AC component riding on top of our absolute feedback signal and that AC component is then fed into our compensation filter. Um, at the output of the compensation filter we have usually some anti wind up clamping that we are limiting the number range that can be um, put into the peripherals and that number is then directly written to the PWM module. So in this case the our compensator or our controller is directly programming a new duty cycle phase shift or period. And then our plant response to the new uh, switch accommodation um, scheme and changes the output voltage and then we are back, we continue to operate the loop to regulate the output voltage. So as we're not really looking at the value we are adjusting, the inductor current as I mentioned, um, usually we, we have here at the resonant frequency we see a resonant bump and depending on the damping of the system um, that bump can either be higher so when you have a very high efficient uh, power supply it's usually a really sharp sp spike almost uh, that distorts the gain here in this in this region around the resonant frequency significantly and with increasing efficiency or uh, reduced damping the phase drop at the resonant frequency becomes more and more dominant and um, that's a whole complex conjugate pole at the resonance um, also uh, has an effect like two real poles. So that means with every pole the phase folds down by 90 degrees. So uh, we would lose all stability um, across the entire 180 degree range instantly in at that resonant frequency. So by default that system is unstable and this, the more efficient it is the more unstable it gets. So it requires a very careful and proper compensation to make sure that we get enough phase and that we push out the phase and linearize our gain in a way that we end up with the working power supply. And because there's hardly anything we can do about that resonant point here, we always have to kind of work around it. And that has some system limitations which eventually drives us to look into other control uh, options and the, these were then all current based control methods um, implemented by modified switch nodes. So we're trying to, to solve these problems by 
um, yeah, modifying the switch node, allowing it to respond to triggers coming directly from the inductor current or from the power plant to take, take direct control over the uh, inductor current. And um, among these, um, so now we have a direct control method. The modified switch node commutation is, as I said, not part of the feedback loop. It's actually part of the plant. And therefore, the plant transfer function changes significantly because now we are not allowing resonances anymore. So the plant transfer function of a current node system looks different from that one of a voltage uh, uh, controlled system. It's also applicable for fixed frequency, variable frequency, variable frequency in particular for hysteretic modes um, where you determine the peak current and the valley current by adjusting thresholds. So if the valley current would be zero, then you would have something like a boundary mode or a quasi resonant mode. If this is non-zero, then you have a classical hysteretic controller. Um, constant on time uses the PWM module to inject um, a pulse of a specific constant length and then just wait until the current drops back to zero before it turns on and generates the next pulse. So these are different techniques of kind of the same idea and modifications or let's say derivatives of the basic implementation of, of, of a peak current mode controller. Um, so peak current mode control in particular is the starting point when we are starting to look into average current mode control because it, there, is, um, there are differences, um, but there are also a lot of similarities. And we can derive a lot of the control techniques we learned from peak current mode control implementations and apply it um, for an average current mode controller. So if we are uh, modifying our switch node uh, modulator by uh, adding this comparator, which compares the most recent inductor current with uh, the reference, which is now coming from the voltage loop. So the voltage loop is not directly programmed the, the PWM anymore. It's just providing the current reference we need to get to the current uh, or to the switch node uh, modulation that would be required to achieve that output voltage. So um, when we do this, um, then the comparator will cut off the current at the moment when it hits the, the, the programmed or the desired peak current. And that changes, as I said, the transfer function. So when we look, compare the transfer function of a current mode system, then um, we don't see that dominant resonant point anymore. And because there is only one plant pole left, which is in a different location from the resonant frequency, that means that uh, also our phase doesn't fold down that aggressively and makes it more, much more convenient to operate um, or to, to tweak and manipulate the plant transfer function by our compensator to get to a very nice and linear first order uh, transfer function of the open loop gain. Um, and that's because there is no resonant, there's also no point to we have to work around with. So we now also gain the capability to, uh, we gain more freedom in adjusting crossover frequency and uh, phase and, uh, and gain margin. So depending on system requirements, this is an excellent system that can be tuned to uh, more specifically to the needs of the application or of the final load. And at the same time, because it's, um, uh, the, it's a comparator which immediately responds in any, to any variation um, uh, in, the, in the volt seconds applied across an inductor, it, is, it also gains some sort of built-in feedforward capability. So when we have a transient on the input voltage and the volt seconds across the inductor changes, while we are operating the power supply, then the, the, the peak current will be reached a little bit later because the slope of the current changes. And then um, our inducted charge would still match uh, the desired amount of energy even if the volt second have changed. So and that capability makes that system much more stable and also the output impedance is, is very deterministic. So it hardly changes. Um, the downside here is um, to make a peak current mode controller work, that requires that you have a very fast um, current feedback. And current sensing can get very challenging in, in applications and with increasing power, it's getting more and more challenging because there are actually no uh, lossless 
current sense techniques maybe other than a hall sensor. But every time we use something like a hall sensor or a shunt, um, that is usually the, uh, deriving its, its feedback from, um, from very small signals requiring very large amplification. And then that amplifier has always comes with, a, a, with its own transfer function. So there's always some limitation in bandwidth and in many cases also a phase shift. And a phase shift in a peak current mode control is poison uh, because it, uh, it kind of distorts the computation of our switch node. And even if it just responds, responds to AC um, variations, um, there, is, there is a certain limit of what you can accept. Uh, so if the bandwidth of your current feedback signal is too poor to uh, satisfy the needs, your peak current mode controller won't or just stops working at some point. Um, and then there's one very specific problem with peak current mode control you most probably are aware of. Um, it's called subharmonic oscillations. And that only exists in fixed frequency continuous conduction mode uh, operation. So and that is uh, eventually the root cause is, is fairly simple. It's a ge geometry problem. So when we are having a nice symmetrical triangular current waveform in our inductor, so we have here the on time, um, so we're charging the inductor up, we open the switch and it discharges. Um, and if there is, um, if the positive is operating in steady state, we always see a nicely symmetrical uh, triangular waveform. So the moment we are changing the reference, so let's assume we have a load step and we need to increase the reference. Um, that means that the comparator uh, increases the reference and trips the switch later at a later point of time. So the ramp, however, doesn't change because the volt seconds haven't changed. So the current slope now starts to rise a little bit longer, having less time to discharge. And we will end up with some DC error. And that DC error makes the next slope start at an earlier time running shorter until it still hits the same reference. Um, and then it has a longer time to discharge uh, and we end up with a, um, with a smaller amount of, of um, delta current, current delta. And um, as we see when we, are in, when we are perturbating the reference, so we're changing the reference and step it up. Um, we have a large perturbation here in the first cycle as an immediate response and then in a smaller one in the following cycles. So that works out for everything that's below 50% uh, due to cycle. There we have a ge geometry where the injected uh, oscillation, basically, or the, the asymmetry in our triangular waveform um, self compensates. So it's kind of just seizing away um, over a couple of cycles until the current has balanced out and we now have achieved our new average current providing power to the output. So unfortunately this geometry changes when we are when the duty cycle changes. So that is usually due to um, a reduction in volt seconds. So the, the input voltage drops, we have less uh, voltage across the inductor when we close the switch. That means the current slope changes and the current requires a longer period of time to get up to the peak current, having um, also less time to discharge. So when we change our reference in this scenario, um, then we have a different geometry where um, the, the DC offset here at the end of the cycle actually starts to increase and it's getting worse with every cycle instead of, uh, of less. So there, um, depending on, on volt seconds across the inductor, we can uh, estimate how many cycles it takes to compensate for a perturbation in reference. So when I change a reference here in this first cycle, then it takes four cycles at 30% due to cycle until all the disturbance has disappeared and we are ending up with a, with a balanced system again. Um, if I change the duty cycle slightly up to 40%, then already takes 9 to 10 cycles until that disturbance has, has disappeared. If I operate it at exactly 50% duty cycle, then any perturbation brought into the system will just persist um, infinitely. And if I go beyond 50%, so here in, in the next example, close to 60%, 
then um, these disturbances start to amplify themselves until the system is violently resonating between minimum and maximum uh, due to cycle limits. And uh, this happens very, very quickly. A simple, uh, tiny perturbation here in the first cycle only ten, takes 10 switching cycle until um, it hits the radio limits. So uh, the method in preventing this uh, is called slope compensation. So with increasing due to cycle, um, we require less reference. Uh, so we're, we don't need, so we, we are turning a constant reference provided to our comparator um, and turn it into a negative ramp across the period. And this is done by um, putting a ramp generator, um, which generates a negative voltage ramp onto the reference coming from the air amplifier. And that negative ramp here needs to be adjusted in a way that every time we are uh, changing the reference um, level, that the, per the, the distortion we are uh, injecting into the system uh, always is kept in the self-compensating uh, region, even if the due to cycle is longer than 50%. So um, that slope compensation technique is um, working very well for almost 30 years now in pretty much every switching regulator. So the thing is, however, that with increasing due to cycle, um, we are more and more suppressing the current from responding immediately. So with increasing due to cycle, um, the effects we want to gain with by having switched to peak current mode control in comparison to voltage mode control starts to, to twingle. It, they are not gone. It's still peak current mode still keeps most of their advantages. But the longer the due to cycles are, the more sloppy, sluggish the, your, your, your system starts to respond. The reason is um, that immediate response capability of the inductor current. So when we change the due to cycle, the current will keep ramping up um, immediately in that very cycle. So you have this immediate response of the inductor current to any change in its control value. And by injecting a negative ramp on the peak current, we are um, suppressing this capability. And um, so now the duty is put on the voltage loop to see that the voltage is not coming up fast enough to keep increasing and incrementing the reference until we finally have balanced out that, uh, that system. So and this is um, when we look at the duty cycle, which results from, uh, from a properly compensated uh, peak current mode control, there's always a perfect, let's say, setup, an ideal setup that would give us um, the so-called critical damping of the subharmonics. So this would be the, the perfect trade-off between performance pressure and uh, or performance and suppression of subharmonics. And that due to cycle, this is what we are trying to calculate directly by uh, in software. And uh, rather than leaving it to a comparator and analog circuit in the plant, taking control over it uh, in a second current loop and work out the numbers required to achieve that perfect perfectly compensated uh, on time for every single switching cycle. Okay, good. So for the implementation of an average current mode control, um, what we're doing now, we are replacing our uh, switch node modulation circuit um, with a second compensator. And that compensator is uh, working just like our voltage loop compensator. So it takes in a reference and the inductor current, but instead of having kind of an open loop drive somewhere in the plant, um, we now have a proper compensation filter. So that is the same kind and type of compensator we are uh, using in the voltage loop in, in current mode. And now we are starting to filter the, um, the modulation and the, the, the changes of the, in the inductor current before we directly program the duty cycle with a desired uh, value to achieve critical, um, critical compensation of its self-oscillating um, characteristic. So the, it brings us the same advantages like peak current mode control. So it has a fairly constant output impedance. 
Um, now, as we are monitoring the current directly, we can also um, have really good overcurrent protection or common current limit. We can also support a sustained uh, overcurrent limit and turn this into a constant current source. Um, we, it is applicable for every kind of commutation method. We can operate it in fixed frequency, variable frequency, phase shift. The only challenge that we really have is that the feedback circuit or so circuit, the, the feedback path itself is getting really complex. And the most complex part um, is that we have now two controllers, two independent loops. One is looking at the voltage, the other one is looking at the current. So they are not looking at the same parameter. And both of them are filters. So they are AC transient machines that generate different outputs with different frequencies, different phase shifts. And it's hard to get them um, balanced in a way that they start that they don't start to work against each other or trigger internal oscillations. And that is the great challenge in analog with when you take uh, all the component uh, tolerances into account because the, the, the frequency synchronization between voltage and current loop is, is critical. And finding the right circuit in analog compensators is tricky. Um, it's not impossible, but it is a tricky task to do. In digital, it's a little bit easier because the precision with which we can place poles and zeros in our compensation filters of each of the controller blocks um, is more precise and gives us more freedom to decide where the locations are supposed to be without influencing the location of the other poles and zeros in our system. And that is why it becomes much easier to establish an average current mode control in digital than it is in analog. So the control system we are trying to establish uh, consists now um, of a outer voltage loop. So we have a voltage loop compensator which monitors the output voltage, same path as before. So we um, read the values here with an ADC, feed the value into an inverting air amplifier. And now that voltage com um, compensator is calculating a reference current instead of uh, a PWM parameter. And that reference is then now compared against the input coming from the current sense from our system and fed in its own independent uh, current compensator where we yet again have an anti wind up and that is the loop that directly programs the PWM. So uh, when we inject, uh, when we just look at the current loop implementation and we inject the transient here um, and measure the so, for example, the plant gain, then we see almost exactly the same plant as in peak current mode control. Um, because there's a filter and that immediate response is not on a cycle by cycle basis, but depends on the size, okay, in digital it depends on the size of your error history. So how much, how many samples are you using to feed through your filter before you achieve a new output? And in, um, in for, for a current mode, usually this is the digital derivative of a type 2 controller. That means we have three samples, three current samples, which are considered during one computation step. And then this is basically moving, uh, a moving filter window always uh, across the last three samples. And um, as we are lacking this immediate cycle by cycle response and turn this into a one in three cycles response, um, it you would expect that there might be some internal oscillation and that is actually not really manifesting itself in the transfer function of the plant. So if you compare them, they're almost identical. And so every um, compensation we apply to, uh, to, an, to a current loop here is identical to how we compensate a peak current mode control feedback loop. So again, the plant uh, shows a dominant plant pole um, and usually if your output capacitor has some ESR um, frequency in the range of our switching or control frequency, then you might see an ESR here, but eventually the control system really consists of a zero that's used to compensate for the plant pole. And then you have a high frequency pole, which usually is used to suppress high frequency noise. And um, this is then how the compensator looks like. So here we place the zero, so the gain flattens out. And then here we have a high frequency pole, which eventually just cuts off high frequency content. And eventually we end up with um, an almost identical first order system, just like in peak current mode control. So 
The second step is when we have established the inner current loop, that is now uh, bringing us to the tricky part. How to establish a voltage loop around a peak, uh, an average current, an inner average current loop without um, turning the system into a self oscillating engine. Um, so we have to balance out the, the frequency response of our voltage loop against the frequency response of our compensator. And what, what we still like to have is, is a fast inner current loop because the, the speed of the inner current loop is actually what gives us all the advantages and we definitely want to keep this. So that means um, to prevent um, the system to develop internal oscillations, that means we have to now figure out what is the best way, how we can modulate or perturbate the, the reference of that controller, of this current controller, without driving it into continuous oscillation. And when we look at the, um, at the step response, so here we see um, an output voltage extremely amplified. So you see the voltage ripple across the output capacitor with every switching cycle. And here, this is where the low step uh, drives down the voltage. And then we see the, here first the sharp ESR drop, and then uh, our loop starts to respond. And we see um, there's an, a very quick, fast recovery phase and then um, the control system hits kind of a limit and charges up to back slower in back into regulation. So if we amplify this system and to understand what's happening inside the controller, um, then you see that large error that's fed into the, 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 the compensator is immediately uh, considered with a great magnitude. And um, that provokes the PWM from to, to increase the duty cycle in larger steps here in this initial, during this initial drop period until the voltage has stopped dropping. And only then we are basically stabilizing the duty cycle and then we start to pull it back again. So we have this control overshoot in, uh, during that sharp signal drop. Um, so when we look at the inductor current, what's happening in a fixed frequency continuous conduction mode signal when we control the average current in, uh, in comparison to peak current, then we kind of still see that geometry problem uh, that we have to work around with. So we're starting out from some average current. Um, this is where we see the load step and we have um, a certain uh, ramp slope during the charge period and another ramp slope during the discharge period. And then um, the average current is always tracked at exactly 50% of that rising uh, slope. So the controller that programs the duty cycle knows how long the on time will be. So it can place a trigger to sample at exactly 50% of that on time. And this is how uh, we can track the average current without actually having to average the values we gather. Uh, so we're eventually just tracking a reference point in our current waveform. Um, but as soon as we start to perturbate the reference, so we change the reference, um, we are increasing the duty cycle, or we get a response from the control loop, which increases the duty cycle. And immediately in that very cycle, we will charge more energy into the inductor. So we still have that immediate response, like in peak current mode control. And we have the same problem because now we have a longer on time and less time to discharge. So we have a different starting point here with a significant DC error. And in the next cycle, um, we are again charging up to a higher level. So we are the increment with which we move the current, the total average current up is now basically balanced out. So the speed of our feedback loop and our filter adjustments, the crossover frequency, decides how quickly we can respond. But in comparison to a peak current mode control, it's not a free winning system because we are programming that duty cycle. So we can get the current under control pretty quickly uh, by just pulling back the duty cycle and eventually balancing out the triangular current waveform so that we always end up after a couple of cycles, maybe five, six, seven cycles, depending on how fast you make the loop, um, that disturbance is over and we are nice in clean in average current control again. Okay, so the thing is, however, that change or this modulation of the reference is a continuous process. 
So we barely ever see something that is uh, remaining at exactly precisely the same reference for a long period of time. So um, there's always some noise and some mini transient hitting the system. So the, the reference of the current is continuously uh, affected by noise and most minute changes and then obviously interrupted by large signal changes and large uh, load transients. So eventually that system and the transfer function we saw when we uh, looked only at the current uh, loop, that always assumed a constant reference. Um, but in reality um, that current loop is, uh, is stimulated by two sides. So we have one stimulation side from the current transient, which is uh, sampled from, from the plant, but we also have the continuous modulation um, and stimulation through the reference. So eventually we have two different systems with two different frequency domain characteristics uh, deciding how that filter here is supposed to work. And um, when we inject the transient here, um, we get the inverted phase shifted response out of the voltage loop that is fed into the current loop and the current loop then tries to respond to that new error. Um, uh, but it's as the current is really fast and responding almost immediately, um, there's always a mismatch between the, the, the there's a relatively slow changing reference and the fast transient adjustments we need to do to bring um, the average current into regulation. And the differences in, in, the, in the time scales then uh, result in a transient frequency that's a total transient frequency that's seen by the current loop which uh, consists of overlapping uh, oscillations. And that can become a very chaotic system. And if the voltage loop keeps perturbating the reference too often, too fast, with a too large a magnitude, then this is where uh, we will continuously inject oscillations into the current loop, which will result in continuous oscillations in the voltage, which makes the voltage loop respond to these oscillations, again, increasing the perturbation complexity on, on the current loop, and this is where things go haywire. So what we so the the first approach or the first idea that comes to mind is yeah let's just slow down the voltage loop because when we slow down the voltage loop just enough to make the reference changes here or to make the reference at least look partially kind of constant then uh, the inner current loop would just work out fine and that is true um, the thing is by uh, trying to make this reference as constant as possible, the margin we are, or the, let's say the level we are trying to get to is um, that we are trying to get, that we do not change the reference until the current loop had enough time to settle the new average current. And only then we are allowed to change the reference again. So that ratio is approximately at a tenth of that crossover frequency of, uh, of that current loop compensator. And that means we are already um, at only, the, when we look at the possible performance and bandwidth we can achieve. So we are now down to uh, achieving a voltage loop response uh, at only a tenth of what the current loop is capable of at this point. So when we are uh, feeding in a transient, um, then uh, we see the transient reception. So the way we are, we are uh, slowing down the voltage loop is here, we don't sample that often. So we are just sampling every 10th cycle. So 10 cycles, we leave it to the current loop to adjust the average current, and then we change the reference from the voltage loop. So eventually a high frequency transient would be translated into something step-ish. So every 10th cycle we will have an increment and decrement in current reference waiting for the current to settle, then we make the next step, waiting for settle, make the next step, and so on. So then um, the inverted version of what we see here will be the output of the voltage loop, and this is then uh, our effective current um, reference adjustment. And that then also uh, starts to show up at the output. So when the voltage loop changes the reference, 
and the inner current loop um, adjusts the current, we will always have this step. Every 10, second, uh, every 10 switching cycles, we have a step, some oscillation until the current has settled, and then we have constant uh, status, and then there's the next step. So the, the, more, the, the more you delay the voltage loop update, um, the more uh, you will see this digital artifacts manifesting themselves at the output. So, and then the internal transient is then also always these large signal steps. And the longer you wait, the more the voltage might have changed. The bigger the step in the reference, the more aggressive the response from the current loop. So things are only getting worse. Um, and then there's another problem when you don't oversample the output voltage often enough. And this is when the transients on the incoming feedback signals have a higher frequency than our sampling frequency, then we're starting to, to run into another issue. Um, so, and this is um, called alias frequencies. And this really only exists in digital systems. So here is an example signal waveform. Um, there's a feedback signal, um, which is uh, 18 times slower than our sampling frequency. So, and if we have a ratio like 18 or 20-ish, then um, oversampling that signal works perfectly well. So we can uh, perfectly reproduce that in uh, continuous time domain feedback signal um, with our ADC um, fractional discrete time domain points and representations. The, um, when the incoming feedback frequency or transient frequency is getting higher and is approaching, approaching for, for example, here is only eight times slower than our sampling frequency, then um, the resolution we get on that signal is getting really poor. And um, we are still able to track it, but there's a new phenomenon um, which we can find in our data points. And this is, there's a low frequency content, um, which is caused by our incapability in capturing the amplitudes of that signal. And that is called an alias frequency. So this is a frequency that only exists in our digital data set and is not real. Um, and if I go up to the Nyquist uh, frequency, so Shannon Nyquist limit at half of the sampling frequency, then this alias frequency will be the only thing I am able to see. So I don't even see the real frequency anymore. So that is an issue when you are um, when you're sampling too slow. So that means to prevent that, we have to make sure that none of these high frequencies that would kind of go into this range where our ADC oversampling starts to fail will ever be able to enter the system. And that only works with uh, aggressive filtering. And the, the best implementation for, for this approach is to have an anti-alias filter in analog, simple RC, at the, at the device pin before we actually sample the, the signal. And then we have yet another averaging filter um, after we received the most recent sample from the ADC. So now we have something really slow. And that really slow can be uh, turned into a real slow uh, transient um, profile, which then goes through the loop. And then eventually we will still have these steps between the long sampling periods, but um, they are less aggressive. And then also the response of the current loop will be less aggressive. You might still observe some artifacts at the output, but usually they are small. And that is then really um, a fine matter of fine tuning how to get everything uh, in, in a shape that is acceptable. So that implementation is very common. Uh, but it is uh, it always results in a very low bandwidth um, feedback response. So fast current response injects noise, and that noise can only be eliminated by filtering and prolonging the response from the voltage loop, making the system slower and slower and slower. And the more noise issues you encounter, uh, the more dominant that stepping artifact at the output will manifest. That then also requires that you have more filtering and then it, it, it only is, it, it's a death spiral that just pulls the system down and you cannot expect any reasonable performance out of that implementation. However, it is um, a fast, safe and robust 
um, implementation method. And if you don't need performance, if it's just a battery charger, super stable system, stable large capacitive load that would swallow all the artifacts that uh, the loop is generating at the output, it could still be a decent control implementation, which doesn't cause much trouble, which is fairly fast to set up and fine tune until you're satisfied. So, but what is if we are trying to uh, design something that needs a little bit more performance? Um, in this case, there's a second option how we can reduce um, the current perturbation from the voltage loop without actually delaying its sampling. Um, so we are operating both loops simultaneously and we make the voltage loop slower by reducing its crossover frequency. And then we can use a same or a similar ratio. So we can uh, adjust the crossover frequency of the voltage compensator at a tenth of that of the current compensator. And then I will still consider every single sample in every single switching cycle in the voltage loop. So when I inject a high frequency transient, it would still pick, um, be picked up by the voltage loop and immediately processed and turned, but it will be just damped down to a very small level so that the, the resulting um, current reference change is small. And small changes, if I perturbate um, the current loop at a high frequency with very small changes, then obviously it's much, much easier for the current loop to settle the current at the new desired reference and therefore we don't have artifacts, noise injection, and things which run much smoother. And the implementation here is very similar to the previous one, uh, but we will gain considerably more uh, higher performance. So here, this is um, 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 a result. So we are adjusting um, the, the current loop and the voltage loop in a ratio uh, 10 to 1. So this is the, the open loop transfer function of the inner current loop. So we are adjusting um, the crossover frequency at 10 kilohertz. Um, so we can have a phase margin of 30, 60 degrees, gain margin of minus 11 dB, and a nice slope of minus 20 dB per decade. So when we close the voltage loop, we drop its crossover frequency, yeah, in this case, to 1.2 kilohertz or to 1 kilohertz, doesn't really matter so much, and that gives us then the ratio we need so that we have enough damping. We are at approximately minus 20 dB damping on any voltage traffic uh, uh, error before we feed it into, into the current loop as a reference. So now we have a very high good frequency noise rejection ratio. Uh, no noise issues, no artifacts at the output anymore. And the minimum perturbation of the current sense is, uh, is guaranteed so that the current will always settle before we make the next adjustment. But it's still, by reducing the crossover frequency of the voltage loop, we still have a, a low bandwidth response. It's not as bad as with the other approach, but still um, we cannot expect to get this up to a high performance system. Nevertheless, it might be good enough. Yeah, battery charges, LED drivers. Now we can maybe even apply this to low, low performance DC to DC converters or for power factor correction, that, um, that implementation would also work. Um, so now I think when we are going for high speed uh, average current mode control implementation, um, we have to find a different way uh, because that, that issue that the current loop always gets um, stimulated from through two ports from the feedback and the reference simultaneously and that you have the overlap of these two different frequency domain characteristics and two different frequencies um, is an issue. So there must be hopefully some ratio or some relation between the two stimuli that we can arrange in a way that we are um, getting in some kind of ideal condition that every time we change the reference and the current loop picks up the new reference and starts to adjust the current and the current settling time kind of matches up perfectly. And this is what we are trying to, uh, to achieve by enforced phase locking. Um, so the basic idea is coming from a weird place. Um, internally we call this the Kuromato synchronization method, um, which is not true. It's not the Kuromato model implementation. But um, 
the idea comes from Kuramato, um, from the Kuramato model. So therefore, uh, warm thanks to uh, Yoshiki Kuramato for pointing us into this direction. And also a very warm thank you to Omicron Lab for giving us a device that can uh, that enables us to figure all this out and how to implement it. So the Kuramato model is actually um, um, comes from mechanics. Um, so it is the theory about frequency coupling um, of independent oscillators. So usually this is what you have in architecture, bridges, um, other mechanical systems that are have uh, components with their own individual natural frequency. And when they uh, that frequency is excited, if they start to oscillate, they start to influence coupled systems that then also start to oscillate with their natural frequency. And then obviously there are resonances between them and that could lead to the destruction in of, of uh, architectural elements like bridges and so on, as we've seen in the past. And there's the super famous um, example here where you have um, four different metronomes uh, swinging at different frequencies uh, and you put them on a piece of wood on top of two tins of coke and then this um, free moving uh, piece of wood that kind of picks up some uh, some frequency generated by the metronomes. And that's a quite chaotic frequency. So it keeps moving back and forth and back and forth. And at some point you have magically tune all the metronomes in exactly the same frequency, no matter uh, how you position the weight. So they are set up to swing at different frequencies but that enforced coupling through that moving element is then what forces them into the same frequency. And then eventually you have a synchronized system which develops its own natural resonant frequency. And this is where everything starts to, to swing in sync. So that is actually what you try to prevent in architectural elements, but this is exactly what we have been looking for. So we were looking into this, uh, into this approach. And when you look at the, um, at the Wikipedia article about the Kuramato oscillators and uh, the Kuramato model, then you find three different um, face locking uh, conditions. So if you have systems which um, uh, have an, a phase angle of their oscillation in the same in the same region, then you kind of this is what enforces this self synchronization of the system. The more the phases are distributed, the less it is likely that you end uh, that you can find a deterministic single common uh, natural frequency of all the freewheeling oscillators together. So in mechanics or in the Kuramato model, this only works and everything is determined by a strong coupling, the cup coupling between the, the various oscillators. Okay, and unfortunately, this is not true for power supplies. There is no such thing like a strong coupling element that ties everything together and would force an, an, um, a compensator uh, frequency domain into the same resonant natural frequency as the plant. This is not there. Um, but if we know how phases must be organized and phase, ang phase angles must be combined, to actually develop a common natural frequency, then we can take advantage of that um, of, of this idea and set up our, our feedback loops and our plan transfer function in a way that we artificially enforce the system to have same phase angles in every single independent transfer function. And this is what we're trying to do now. So we look at the voltage mode plans and we find the resonant frequency of the LC tank. And then we compare it to the current mode plant transfer function. And what we find is that the crossover frequency of the plant transfer function coincides with our resonant frequency of the voltage plant. In this particular case, it's at 4.7 kilohertz. And we also find that in both transfer functions, we have a phase angle of exactly 90 degrees. So if we are now plugging in our feedback loop, um, what we were focusing on is that we are using the zero location that is originally meant to compensate for the plant pole, this guy here. Um, but you can still, it is not a big harm if we move this out of that pole uh, location because the plant pole, by the way, 
is changing anyways with load and voltages. So that is not a super precise uh, fixed point we can directly compensate for. So because it keeps moving, um, the zero location is usually somewhere, has to be somewhere in that region, and that is in most cases good enough. And now we take this freedom of being allowed to move the zero around to adjust the phase angle of our compensator in a way that the open loop gain matches the 90 degrees at 4.7 kilohertz. So this is how we set up the inner current loop for the, and then we run a measurement. But now we are not really interested in uh, learning about the open loop gain of the current loop itself. We would like to see the open loop gain of the current loop when it's get it, getting perpetrated by the voltage loop. So instead of injecting into the current feedback signal to measure this loop alone, um, while it's running from a constant reference, we are now injecting the error in our voltage divider, into our voltage feedback. Um, so to make sure that the voltage loop is not there yet, we don't know how to set it up yet. So what we want to learn is how does our subsystem, everything that's on the left side, the plant together with the current loop, we kind of push the current loop into the plant and say, okay, this, whatever comes back, um, this is our new plant we have to set up our voltage loop controller for. So to, to be able to do this, we replace our proper compensator with a simple unity gain loop. So that loop is a P controller or a type of a P controller that is putting or pushing the output into, a, uh, so into a, close to what you would expect during normal operation. But any transient that enters the system would just pass through. So it's a, it has a continuous gain of one. So if we perform a measurement like this, then the voltage loop becomes transparent and we can observe the transfer function uh, of the voltage loop plus the plant what seen from the voltage loop. And this is what we find. Uh, so here you see a bundle of measurements where we have uh, different gain levels in the, in the current loop. And what was very interesting to find is this uh, resonant peak here. And um, I already mentioned that when we are changing the duty cycle uh, by the current loop, that the current does ramp up immediately, but it still takes a couple of cycles until it settles. So that's kind of the same problem we find in peak current mode control. And the same happens now in average current mode control. So even an average current mode controller is still able in generating subharmonics. It's just that the subharmonics are manifesting themselves in a different frequency range. So here um, it pops up uh, so the, the switching frequency would be 500 kilohertz. So a peak current mode controller would start to resonate at 250 kilohertz. But here it is uh, starting to oscillate at roughly 85 kilohertz. So significantly below where you would see peak current mode subharmonics. Uh, so and it turns out that this resonant point where the even an average current mode controller starts to develop subharmonics is at the sampling frequency divided by the length of the error history. And that kind of makes sense. So this is the moving window. So the number of samples we are processing in our filter and whatever response is given by that engine that is just moved through the uh, delay line of our control history uh, always produces one output, one change in duty cycle. And uh, with usually that circle is tuned for making the output settle within a certain amount of time. So the more gain we put into the current loop, the faster we make it, the more likely it is that it still starts to develop subharmonics. Um, even if they are not as dominant as in peak current mode control, so you still see the effect of the filter, but they are present. So when we are taking this measurement, um, the interesting part is that we are not able to to see this when we just look at the inner current loop. So we have to go through the path in injecting transients into the voltage loop and look at the, at the current loop from the voltage loop, just like we do it for in, in peak current mode control to discover that they actually exist. And now we have the capability to adjust the gain of our feedback loop uh, in a way that this bump here remains to be at, yeah, at least minus 20 dB just the same rules applying as in peak current mode control. So you're trying to suppress these subharmonics at minus 20 dB or less.
Uh, so in our case, we picked that blue line here. This is kind of at yeah, minus 25 dB. This is the suppression level of the subharmonics, and that's the gain level in which we are adjusting the inner current loop. So the second thing is that the phase angle here, um, so we see that here somewhere at that uh, 4.7 kilohertz, we still have a phase angle of 90 degrees. That's coming naturally by the, generated by the um, inner current loop seen from the voltage loop. And what we also discover is that there's a pole. And that pole is also not measurable when we just look at the inner current loop. It only shows up when we go again through in the injected voltage loop method to actually discover that there is a pole that folds down our phase in, in this region. And so we have to adjust um, the zero for the plant pole in a way that we match the 90 degrees at this point as well. So now we have matched the inner current loop and the plant both uh, off, um, on that 90 degrees um, phase angle. So, and now the voltage loop can now be basically swapped out. So we have a transfer function and we just use this as a planned transfer function. And as we have a pole, we place a zero, and then we have a high frequency pole that we use to further suppress these potential uh, high frequency oscillations generated by the current feedback. And then um, by replacing the voltage loop controller, we can now perform a proper open loop measurement of the entire system. And what we find is a classical current mode implementation, um, perfectly well uh, suited, has a nice um, deterministic static crossover frequency, no matter if you change the input voltage. So as you see, phase change and uh, gain change, this is due to changes in input voltage and load. So we ran a couple of measurements to, um, to, to measure all the corner points of our topology. And eventually uh, we end up with a, with a system that has phase variations between 75 degrees and uh, 53 degrees and gain margin variations between minus eight and minus 11 uh, with a super stable uh, crossover frequency at eight kilohertz. So we are eight times faster than any uh, of the other implementations by just um, tweaking our phase angles and making them match. So the most recent results is now the enforced phase locking of voltage and current loop um, are stable and super reliable. The output performs just nice. We have gained a significant step forward in, in performance. So for high frequency, uh, high performance DC to DC converter, we now seem to have found something that could solve the problem, the bandwidth issues with uh, common, more common average current mode control implementations. And um, when you look at both transfer functions, so the way the current loop responds now versus how the voltage loop responds, the really interesting takeaway here is now we actually put everything upside down. We slow down the current loop and speed it up the voltage loop instead the other way around. And we are still able to, um, to get all the, the advantages we would like to have from an average current mode control implementation. And if you think about this for a second, it actually makes sense. Current feedback is responding within the cycle you're making the change to the system. So, the current response itself by just modulating a duty cycle, allowing the current to charge more energy into the inductor in the single cycle, that's the fast part. And this is always there, no matter how I modulate the reference. So you don't really need that filter speed, so that high crossover frequency. So because that only creates trouble, that only injects noise, um, and the faster you get, the more noise you had, and the longer it takes for the current to settle into the new uh, current reference. So the approach taken here is actually establishing a slower uh, compensation filter for the current loop, slowing down the current response, and then use the voltage loop and just perturbate the reference faster. And that turns out um, that the best ratio between both can be found by just locking the phases on top of each other. And um, so at the moment we have just applied this to forward type converters. But if you look into the, into the way um, that is operating, there's no reason to believe that it would not work for any other type of topology, but that's definitely on the to-do list on the very top. Okay, first evaluation 
of applicability in other topology types, and then also um, what happens if you have a slow uh, current feedback signal. Because in our examples here, we had current sense transformers, which almost give us an immediate response with high resolution. So we have a very, very good visibility of the current in real time. When you have something like a shunt amplifier with um, bandwidth limitations and damping and its own frequency domain, that would be interesting to work out how to deal with that one. And we haven't covered this yet. So um, to wrap up, um, the average current mode control is universal. And is especially in digital control, it is kind of a low hanging fruit um, for most implementations because there are the implementation is software and it uses exactly the same methods as we we are applying anyways for the voltage loop. So just replicating and uh, building up this cascaded control system is not really a difficult task. The difficult task is the synchronization between both frequency domains. So uh, average current mode control is very common in PFC and all kinds of DC to DC converters. And if you review some of the older presentations uh, held on the symposium, you might find that pretty much every digital control system implemented a average current mode controller. Um, battery charges and LED drops, and especially battery charges, um, this, this kind of system is very convenient uh, to establish any kind of battery charging profile. So the, the voltage loop has its output clamping and uh, adjust or to turn the whole control system into a constant current source, the only thing you have to do is to clamp the, the output of the voltage loop. And this would give you a system that when you hit that limit, the voltage loop would go into saturation and start producing a constant current reference for the inner current loop. So you're ending up with a constant current source. And um, if your battery has charged up and you reach uh, the maximum cutoff voltage level, then you have this immediate super soft phase over if from constant current to constant voltage for free. Um, that's a built in capability of that control system. And the same is true for LED drivers. If you have to reposition um, the voltage during operation to increase brightness, to compensate for color shifts, um, that is a very elegant system that gives you enough knobs to basically play and adjust your outputs. So, and because we have the visibility of the current and um, good control over the current, it also now becomes the basis for more um, for additional control algorithms like we would need for maximum power point tracking in for solar panels or any other of energy um, uh, renewable energy source. Um, it also allows us to uh, implement something like bidirectional control. So when you have a bidirectional capable uh, topology like a phase shifted full bridge or um, a simple synchronous buck converter, reverse boost converter or a full switch buck boost, um, the current mode control um, basically satisfies both, both directions simultaneously. So you can use one and the same control system, just allow negative currents and positive currents and the control system would just work out in exactly the same way. We have the sustained current limit capability and um, it's less restrictive on current feedback quality. So, um, okay, this frequency locking approach put aside for a moment. If we have to deal, uh, establish an average current mode controller and we have a really slow and sluggish feedback uh, coming from a shunt amplifier with, I don't know, 100, um, 100 gain, um, then Obviously, there will be a phase shift, there will be damping, there will be a frequency domain that delays the signal and makes it a little bit more sluggish and sloppy. But um, we're just sampling at a different time to capture the right average current value. So it's quite easy to deal with these uh, limitations, which then also reduces the, uh, let's say, the, the cost and the complexity of the current sense uh, method you're applying into your system. And that would still work just well with average car mode control. It will have impacts on the bandwidth, but anything else but the bandwidth would still work out perfectly well. Um, the downside or one of the challenges is when you plug this into a digital controller, that means you are now having to uh, compute two compensation filters. So the CPU load doubles in comparison to any other implementation. And um, classical configuration then, yeah, like we have seen approach number one or two, always give you a fairly slow system. So you can't 
um, really compete with the achievable bandwidths you couldn't shoot for in peak current mode control or voltage mode control. So very promising is this face locking uh, method. Um, that might be uh, one method when we uh, learn a little bit more about it and apply it to more and more applications that this kind could potentially become the key that can unlock that potential for higher performance so that we can really plug in high performance, high bandwidth feedback loops by applying average current mode control in comparison to anything else. Thank you very much.